I would hear all the time from kids on college campuses starting years ago about how they didn't feel safe. I stopped donating to Columbia University about five years ago. And every time they send me a donation, I take a black Sharpie and I write protect your Jewish students and I stick a stamp on it and I mail it back. This hypocrisy, this double standard, all of this needs to be brought to light. You know, let the sun disinfect it. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, editor-in-chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. And you are listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Thanks for joining us. We're continuing our JNS coverage of the war on Israel that was launched by Hamas on October 7th and the surge on in, in anti-Semitism in the United States with a conversation with pro-Israel social media influencer Dr. Sheila Nazarian. But first, I want to remind you to like this video and podcast, subscribe to JNS, and click on the bell for notifications. I also want to remind you that you don't have to wait a full week for more Top Story analysis. There is a daily Top Story podcast where I share more news and analysis with you about the most significant issues we're facing today. You can find The Daily Show under Top Story with Jonathan Tobin on the JNS channel on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find the latest news, including Top Story and other JNS TV content, by going to JNS.org or Telegram and subscribe. And now to today's program. The war being waged against Israel isn't just a matter of Hamas terrorist attacks and rockets, nor is it even solely a matter of combating biased media coverage in corporate broadcast outlets and newspapers. Though many in the governing class as well as in the organized Jewish world have been slow to pick up on it, in the third decade of the 21st century, political battles are also being waged on the internet and especially on social media. Many, if not most people today, especially younger generations, get their news primarily from their social media feeds and not by reading websites or apps run by media outlets, let alone by the increasingly obsolete medium of print. Whether on Facebook or the platform called X, formerly known as Twitter, Instagram, or the ubiquitous TikTok, public discourse is increasingly a matter of debate on these platforms rather than on television screens, radio, or publications printed out on paper. It is a given that this has led to a dumbing down of arguments since social media or internet sites do not necessarily lend themselves to deep thinking, complicated arguments, what we in the media call long-form journalism. But that does not mean that social media strategies can be unsophisticated. Moreover, the stakes involved in social media couldn't be higher as the battle for public opinion, particularly with respect to the efforts to refute the delegitimization of Israel and to propagate falsehoods about genocide in Gaza or apartheid in the Jewish state, and the struggle against anti-Semitism in general, increasingly hinges on the ability of Jewish and pro-Israel forces to master the ability to get the truth out on these platforms and to do so in convincing and credible manner. That's been evident since the October 7th massacres, when almost immediately after the mass murder, rape, torture, and kidnapping spree of Palestinians in southern Israel, those cheering on the terrorists immediately attempted, largely successfully, to flip the narrative in the media from one of aggression and barbarism carried out against Israel to one about how unfair it was for Israel to seek to ensure that its genocidal opponents would be unable to repeat their crimes. The subsequent surge of anti-Semitism around the world was not just a matter of mobs demonstrating on college campuses and the streets of American cities, but also on social media. To some extent, those who are tasked with the job of presenting the case for the State of Israel have picked up on this, and the social media accounts of the Israel Defense Forces and other government ministries have taken seriously the necessity of putting out the truth in a matter that makes sense on TikTok or X. But it is equally important for Jews around the world who care about the survival of the Jewish state and to roll back the tide of anti-Semitic invective to be just as savvy and vigilant. This aspect of the war has also exposed the hypocrisy 
of many of those celebrities and others who are termed influencers. Many, if not most, of those who use their large followings to highlight human rights or social justice causes have either remained silent about the attacks on Israel, the plight of the hostages, or the anti-Semitism that has become commonplace in public discourse, or actually join the other side. That includes many who are Jewish, but now fear going against the woke orthodoxy that seeks to demonize Israel and the Jews. Worse, it is specifically on social media that many of the worst canards and smears of Israel have been mainstreamed. The Jewish world must either fight this battle and fight it intelligently, or it will soon realize that not only will they have lost the ability to persuade young people of the truth of justice of Israel's cause, but also public opinion in general. To discuss this, we're pleased to have with us today someone who has been in the thick of this fight. Dr. Sheila Nazarian is not only a renowned plastic and reconstructive surgeon in Beverly Hills and the founder of The Skin Spot, a collection of medical grain skin care and wellness products, she's also a television star who has appeared in Emmy-nominated Netflix series such as Skin Decision, as well as E! News, The Doctors, PragerU, Inside Edition, Newsmax, and The Real, as well as The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, Basketball Wives, and Revenge Body with Khloe Kardashian. As an immigrant from Iran, she builds her business from the ground up and inspires other entrepreneurs to do the same through the Nazarian Institute, and where she helps entrepreneurs to think big, branding, and she has a large social media following, with more than 1.7 million followers, which she has used to advocate for Israel and against anti-Semitism. Dr. Sheila Nazarian, welcome to Tom's Story. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's so great to meet you. I have I see you every morning in my inbox. Let's put it that way. Well, thank you. It's uh, it's uh, great to meet you as well. Great to have you on the show. Thanks for taking the time to join us because I know you. you have a very busy day. I know. Today is especially lovely. Go ahead. Yeah. I want to start by asking you why someone like yourself who has a busy medical career as well as a business to run something of a career in media and entertainment as well, have become almost as well known for your advocacy for Israel and Jewish causes as for anything else. What's motivating you to put yourself on the line at a time when so many prominent Jews, especially those in business and even more so with a connection to the entertainment world, have stayed silent about these issues even after October 7th? Yeah, um, I actually started with that because see, about four years ago, my daughter was applying to my high school and I said, oh my God, she's, you know, four years away from college. I went to Columbia University, which is making headlines, as you know. And I just said, if I don't start saying something about Judaism and normalizing Judaism, she's going to get to campus and not have the amazing conversations that college is all about, right? It's all about staying up, talking to the guy down the hall, talking to the girl on the other floor, learning about their life experiences. And you know, having those conversations. Uh, and what's the point of going to college if everyone's walking on eggshells and hiding their identity? Like that's the whole point of college is, is, is those, those conversations. So I started with a very trepidatious hashtag Shabbat Shalom on an Instagram post on a Friday night. And I was freaking out because we're first generation Iranians. We literally escaped on the back of a pickup truck into Pakistan in 1985. Uh, and you never said you were Jewish. You would change your last name to not sound Jewish. Uh, no mezuzahs, no cardboard cutouts of dreidels and, you know, Hanukkiahs during Hanukkah. And so it actually took a lot of courage for me to just do hashtag Shabbat Shalom. Shortly thereafter, uh, they were trying to redo ethnic studies curriculum in California, and they were removing Holocaust education. So one of my friends was uh, hosting a rally in front of the federal building. And she said, hey, would you come talk at the rally? So my family's like, are you crazy? Do they have security? Is the FBI going to be there? Like, who's going to keep you safe? And I was like, it's going to be OK. So, you know, I went, I spoke at the rally and my husband swooshed me off of stage and like removed me from the premises, you know, to keep me safe. And so I just want everyone to hear that I wasn't born brave. Like I, this was a very much, you know, making myself 10% uncomfortable living there for a moment and then making myself 10% more uncomfortable living there for a minute and then slowly becoming, you know, this loud, crazy lioness on social media. Uh, so then 
October, you know, then it was the May 2021 conflict. And I went nuts. My entire Instagram went from breasts and Botox to Israel, Israel, Israel. And I think that it was really like looking back on that moment, I was posting eight hours a day. I was explaining, you know, defending, having, a, you know, private conversations on Instagram with strangers for eight hours a day. It was the first time in my life that I've experienced anxiety. And this is coming from someone who's lost, I lost my mom when I was 16 to cancer. We escaped Iran under gunfire. And that the first time in my life that I experienced real anxiety was during that time. I was getting threats. Um, you know, just, it was a lot. It was a lot, but I was kind of in survival mode and I couldn't stop posting for 30 days. Then everything happened in Iran, Jonathan, with the woman life freedom movement. And I hesitated. And I lived in Iran, but I didn't feel like I need to post about that like I did about Israel, where I have, I've never lived in Israel. But I think, you know, the ambivalence and the pause was because I knew how they treated their Jews. I knew if you dropped me in the middle of Iran and someone started beating this Jewish girl up, I don't know if someone would come to my rescue. But I know if you dropped me in Israel, someone would come to my rescue. And I think that that's why it was so you know, part of my core core to post and to be loud and to defend uh, our homeland. Um, so yeah, that's kind of uh, where it started. And then, you know, kind of calmed down a little bit. I, I could, I would hear all the time from kids on college campuses starting years ago about how they didn't feel safe. I stopped donating to Columbia University about five years ago. And every time they send me a donation, I take a black Sharpie and I write protect your Jewish students and I stick a stamp on it and I mail it back. Um, I've been telling them when they ask me to be an ambassador for them, I've been telling them your Jewish students aren't safe on campus and they didn't believe me. The people were asking at least. And so I'm actually, I think one of the silver linings about October 7th is the Ashkenazi Jews woke up because the Persian Jews have been screaming very loud for a very long time, I'll let you know that. that. But we feel less lonely now. So I think that's a silver lining. I think the Jewish people obviously have never been more united, which is always a good thing for us. And um, I think people are starting to listen to each other. I wrote an article in Tablet Magazine, start listening to Jews who don't vote, look, or act like you. And I got so many phone calls from very progressive Jews saying, we want you to come speak at our shul, we're let, ready to listen to you. So I think unless you've grown up in an Islamist, socialist environment and seen what that does to a country, everything sounds good if you say it really fast, right? Like diversity, equity, inclusion. Sounds great if you say it really fast, you know? Like, why is the Shah living in a castle when there's homeless people on the street? Sounds good if you say it really fast, but you know, in actual practice, you know, when you take away meritocracy, when you take away uh, competition, when you take it it, it, it kills the human soul. People want to know if I'm working harder, it's going to result in more. Yes, equal opportunity, but no equal outcomes. And so I think that I'm smelling what I smelled in Iran in America right now. I have a friend who escaped North Korea. She says the stuff they're teaching me at Columbia University is what they were teaching me in North Korea. I mean, we need to really and quickly, and I know you are, you're doing your best, I'm doing my best, but we really and very quickly need to wake everyone up. You've alluded to your origin story as an immigrant who was literally smuggled out of Iran with your mother, I believe, to and coming to the United States. As someone who was born in a country where Jews were not free, what are your thoughts about all the Jews, I mean, you've spoken of more Jewish unity than ever, and I think that's, to a large extent, true, but there are still plenty of Jews who hold themselves aloof, or worse, like, uh, for example, Oscar winner Jonathan Glazer, who uh, made a splash on international TV just uh, you know, just this week, and others who join in the crowd bashing Israel. I mean, how do you, how do you feel about that? As someone who has a foot in the entertainment industry, who you know, who lives in Beverly Hills, and maybe you know has has encountered a lot of these fav, you know, sort of well-known Jews who are silent. 
There's so many people that are silent, but I will tell you in private, I've seen them at, you know, different uh, meetings and they don't want to take a picture, but they, you know, they agree with everything you're saying. For every, you know, one uh, Jew that is like, I refute my Judaism, there's thousands that are like, you're psychotic. So I just want to let people know you're not alone. Way more people are not agreeing with him than, you know, you know, are proud of their Jewishness and would, would defend, you know, Israel and their religion and freedom of religion. They're just, you know, afraid to lose a job. I work for myself. I will tell you, Jonathan, that when I first started posting for Israel in 2021, I lost 3000 followers in the first 30 minutes. And I thought that I was never going to work again. I thought like all my patients were going to leave me. And I was like, you know what? I did it. I made it. Now it's time to like give it all up for my core values, you know? But actually the opposite happened. Um, my patients, now when they see me, they start crying. They're like, I loved you before. I'm obsessed with you now. I'm so proud to know you. Like, because it's so sad that saying what you think in the United States of America has become an oddity. You know, my parents risked everything, including their lives, to get us out of Iran so we could have freedom of thought and freedom of speech. And people are afraid to exercise those rights. It's so sad. Yeah, I think you're right. Many of those who are silent aren't necessarily in sync with the anti-Israel smears, but they do fear being canceled for being a Zionist or an open Jew. And I guess... The question I'm sure that you get asked a lot is what makes you think that it's worth that risk um, or to be canceled? And now, you know, some of us, um, maybe like you and me, you work for yourself. I, you know, I'm I'm in a Jewish media and I'm uncancelable. Yes. But for a lot of people, it is a risk. Um, well, I'll tell you, I don't think you get canceled unless you apologize or give in to it. Never apologize if you're speaking to your core values and you're coming from a place of love. When you say something and then you backtrack, you just canceled yourself. Never do that. Horrible idea. Bad, bad, bad. No. So what you do is you, speaking from experience, what you do is you say what you think in an intelligent, very strategic way, as if you're gonna run for president in five years and anything you say can will be used against you. So I'm not saying don't be smart about it. I'm not saying don't be strategic about it, but don't ever apologize for speaking to your core values when you know you're right and when you know you're coming from a good place. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the dynamic with most cancellations, maybe not all, but most, is that people do get intimidated. But of course, there's a reason why they get intimidated because in much of public life, um, in many industries, certainly in education, lots of fields, it's very difficult to stand out. There is a new orthodoxy. Uh, you have already alluded to it, the woke, you know, what I like to call the woke catechism of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is rooted in critical race theory and intersectionality that basically grants permission slip to anti for anti-Semitism. But it's very difficult for like most ordinary people to sort of go against the tide. I mean, sometimes it just takes a certain personality, you know, that makes you either a journalist or someone like yourself. But um, there is a risk associated um, with speaking out. Um, you know, even those of us who are on cancel well, you know, I write about Jonathan Glazer and then the next, you know, in the next you know, uh, five hours, my uh, social media feeds and, and email just explodes with anti-Semitism. Most people don't want to risk that. I know, but I just think the risk of not saying anything is so much higher. You know, if you feel like it's bad for you, what's it going to be like for your kids, your grandkids, your little sister, so on and so forth? You know, if you don't utilize your voice now, you're going to lose the right to utilize their voice as many Jews have done in the past. It has never worked for us to not be united, and to stay quiet, ever. Yeah, that's very true. Now, as someone with a presence in the entertainment industry, as well as in beauty and medicine, you're living in an environment where woke ideas and fashionable leftist smears of Jews in Israel as white oppressors of people of color are commonplace. How does that work to create a culture which serves to silence dissent against these lines? So repeat the question. You're saying, how does it work? How, you know, you, you, you've seen it that, you know, how this yeah. new orthodoxy works. 
you know, and it does serve to silence dissent. Um, it does, yeah. Have, have you seen how people have, you know, sort of knuckled under, you know, oh, even yeah. when no, they I know it's wrong? Sure. Just the other day, you know, my, my sixth grader was reading out loud in bed next to me because there was a lot going on. And she's like, can I just read out loud so I could like concentrate on what I'm reading? And she started reading this book that, you know, it was, she's in the sixth grade. She's 12 years old. And it had these nuances of like, arousal and um naughty behavior when your parents aren't looking all this stuff and so i did email the school she started crying uh because she was scared that you know something was going to happen to her her teacher wasn't gonna like her anymore or something but you know i set an appointment with the school i've actually uh i think this whole dei thing not the idea of diversity not the idea of inclusion but dei is an acronym uh, has led to anti-Semitism. It has been documented. And so what I did, Jonathan, is I thought of a separate acronym, which I am speaking to everyone who will listen at this point, called DETAIL. And it's diversity of thought and life experience. So what do we want in a school? You want diversity of thought. Life experience. You want diversity of life experience. That could mean racism. That could mean my life experience of escaping from Iran and, and suffering socialism. So I've created six pillars of detail, which is going to print this week. I've also done five articles on detail. And the reason why I did it is in certain progressive spaces, if you go in and you just say kill DEI, you're gonna get shot down. You can't do that. You have to go in and say, you know what? DEI has excluded us. You yourself are saying you want to be inclusive of everybody and whether you're maybe DEI is working great in your institution and it's the perfect version of DEI. But in other institutions, as we've seen, it has led to exclusion. It has led to divisiveness. And by you using that acronym in your organization, you are giving weight and significance to DEI as a whole. So I, I'm suggesting organizations and people go in and say, you know what, DEI at this point, that acronym is a gut punch to the Jews. It's similar to hearing the, the letters KKK. We hate DEI. It has excluded us. It has given a free pass to have anti-Semitism on campus. And so why don't we propose a more inclusive acronym called DETAIL, you know, which doesn't exclude anyone and really, you know, brings in all sorts of life experience, all sorts of uh, diversity of thought. So I think the mistake a lot of people are making is they're going in and they're saying, kill DEI, DEI must die, D-I-E, you know? Instead of saying, we agree with your values of diversity and inclusion, here is a evolution of DEI that is not triggering to anyone and is truly inclusive and, and really diverse. So giving that alternative so they don't feel like, oh, like how do you just get rid of our diversity statement? Everybody, especially in certain you know, states, they're not going to get rid of their diversity statement. So why not go in with an alternative? Right. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, the diversity in DEI is, you know, not very diverse. It's not about diversity of thought. It's not a very inclusive of Jews. And of course, equity is the opposite of equal opportunity. What kind of reception, you know, has has um, your effort to sort of change the acronym gotten? Um, you know, actually, especially when you consider. Mm -hmm. That DEI is sort of part of, you know, is the product of a, you know, sort of long march of progressive Marcuse and all the way up to, you know, um, Derek Bell and, you know, Ibram X. Kendi and, you know, the current anti-racism, uh, you know, um, craze, you know, are, are people willing to listen? Yes, they absolutely are. You know, John, the 92% of organizations have cut their DEI staffing, not like they've cut it by 92%. So DEI staff among, you know, the apples and the Googles and all the stuff has been cut. Those jobs have been cut by 92%. So I think people are looking, they, they know that they need a diversity statement, but they're looking for something that isn't so divisive, that isn't so uh, tainted with a, with a bad connotation. They want something fresh. And so I've actually received pretty, you know, even if they originally are like, no, like we have the perfect version of DEI. Once, you know, I start speaking about it and they start listening, you know, they're like, oh, maybe you should present this to this person on both sides. I have to say, um, I've spoken to three black diversity officers who were fired or mistreated for trying to include Jews in DEI. 
Okay. There was testimony this week in Congress that said 97% of DEI professors on college campuses, when, with, when their social media searched, are critical of Israel. And that's a really nice way of saying it. So how do we include Jews into DEI on college campuses if 97% of the DEI staff, you know, doesn't see Israel in a positive light? How? We need an alternative. Yeah. Now, one of the worst aspects of this surge in anti-Semitism in this country um, that, you know, we certainly have seen, you know, it's no longer a secret after October 7th has been its impact on young people, both in terms of the success that Israel haters have had in sort of changing public education, as well as in conquering college campuses. As a Jewish parent, what are you most afraid of? And how do you think uh, Jewish families should be approaching these problems? You've given us an example of your own willingness to speak up. But again, as with so much else, mo you know, a lot of parents are afraid to do that, um, just as kids are afraid to speak up. Yeah, no, I always say if you're not going to speak up yourself, at least donate or support people who are speaking up. That's number one. Number two is I think the way that these campuses are truly going to change is through a decrease in applications and a decrease in alumni donations. You know, if alumni donations go down by 50%, they're going to pay attention. I don't care how much money they're getting from Qatar. They're going to pay attention. If applications go down by 25%, they're going to pay attention. So I think that there is, you know, that power of the purse. And I don't think that Jews need to be ashamed of how successful we are. We came here with nothing. You know, one of my friends was saying, oh, Sheila, come to Switzerland and, you know, visit our, our land, our new property. You know, our, we built some stuff on our property. This property has been in our generation for hundreds, hundreds of years. No Jew, think about it, can say this land has been within my family for hundreds of years. No one, because we've been ousted from every single country that we've, we've inhabited. And guess what? Every single country that ousts us yeah. goes down. And so I think that we, you know, the United States, we cannot let it go down. And I think we have to fight and we have to keep it. We can't all just like go to Israel. Like the diaspora is important. Israel is important. And, and this sort of play is, is, you know, very necessary to the survival of Jews everywhere, I think. And so, you know, I say, if, you, if you're not going to speak up, speak with, you know, your applications, speak with your donations and um, speak with the law. There's so many lawsuits happening right now against universities. And I gave a speech to a Sephardic temple a few weeks ago with a lot of Persian families who are so afraid to speak. And every time their kids want to say something, they're like, Shh, something's going to happen. Don't speak. And I reminded them, we're in the United States right now. There's laws here. You speak up. Stop telling your kids to shut up. You know, there, there are protections here. We have Title IX, you know, and, and you, you don't tell them to be quiet. You're passing on your trauma. You're making it worse. And uh, I don't know. I just, anyone who will listen, I just, you know, tell them, be proud of who you are. Be proud of your success. Success has now been like deemed privilege, which is like a negative thing. No, we came here on the back of a pickup truck under gunfire by the border police between Iran and Pakistan, I made it to where I am today. That's called grit, that's called resilience. And those are not things that I'm ashamed of. And no one should be ashamed of those things. And the other thing too, Jonathan, I'll tell you, when October 7th originally happened and they did a poll, 52% or 50% of the, you know, the college age students were siding with Hamas over Israel. There was a recent poll done, I think two weeks ago, it was like a Harvard something poll, and it was down to 27%. So there is hope. I think these students originally, when they sound like, oh, intifada, intifada, at some point, they're like, let me look up that word, <laughs> you know? Or if there's all this violence happening, they're like, wait, I don't agree with violence. Like, what am I marching for again? And so I think, you know, the loudest people right now sometimes aren't even from this country. You know, there was another, I was just in New York and we heard um, Jim Tish speak and we heard Dan Center speak you know, from Startup Nation. And they were saying how 25% of kids on college campuses are, are foreign. And guess mm -hmm. what? Guess why, Jonathan? Because they check the DEI box. Right. So it could be the son of a Qatari prince 
but it checks the DEI box and they're paying He's full He's an approved pay. minority, yeah. Yeah, and they're paying donations. So it's like full tuition, donation, and checks a DEI box? Heck yeah. Is that the true intention of DEI? It wasn't it supposed to help people who need a leg up? But no, so the, so the reason why we saw the UPenn and you know all of these the Harvard people not kicking out these are suspending because they lose their visa, they lose the full tuition, and they lose the donations from that country. So that's why they're not holding these kids accountable. But if you watch the protests, you'll see like, hmm, where are these people from? Yeah, well, I think, you know, you, you kind of highlighted because you have an immigrant story. And as such, you understand the importance of American exceptionalism, why this country is different from other places, uh, you know, throughout the history of the diaspora, and how these kinds of toxic ideas, which enable anti-Semitism, um, really threaten, not, you know, certainly threatens the fabric of American society, if, you know, if people are trying to divide us along racial lines, just at the point when racial harmony was getting, was getting much better, and now we're, you know, we're, we're to be locked in this immutable perpetual race war in which you know everyone is defined by their background um you know as as you know sort of a white oppressor whether they're actually white you know and when and have or or you know have anything to do with with this country's racial past um and and the future of the jewish community is really at stake in these arguments yeah and i mean i think the sixth pillar of detail is e pluribus unum and i think what's happened is we've gotten so multicultural that we you know it's almost like when you break people up into this category this category this category you're 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 actually not just separating people you're weakening the country so when you say yes i appreciate your culture tell me about it and and this multicultural comes together and we realize we're part of one nation and we're all vested in the success of this nation regardless of our background we don't just stay here we actually elevate and so that's why I made that one of the pillars is to remind people, yes, we're a melting pot, but we're all vested in the success of the United States. And that's how we elevate this country and kind of bring it back. I feel like we're witnessing the downfall of, you know, this uh, superpower. And it's happening because everyone's just breaking apart instead of coming together and understanding how special this country is. And I think immigrants know best, you know. Why are all these people pouring into the U.S.? You know, is it because it's a bad country? No, it's because they're escaping socialism. It's because they're escaping yeah. their other countries. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, there is so much at stake. I mean, it's a war on Western civilization. It's a war on America. You know, the 1619 Project, you know, and, and that whole mindset of tearing down this country um, is destroying what made it, you know, a place where immigrants wanted to go to. Uh, what made it a free what makes it a free country and um, obviously there's a, a huge jewish stake here um but you know it's it's more than just actually just the jewish you know what whether jews are going to be comfortable it's the future of this country as a whole exactly um now one of the things that you highlighted about where where people can sort of say no you know hold back on your applications donations but of course one of the sort of pushbacks that i get when i discuss this is People say, well, what are my choices? Where can I send my kids? You know, yeah. um, there's tons of places. You know, um, this, this sort of woke um, anti-Semitism is everywhere. You know, I don't the, think the, it's the, everywhere. It's well, no it, it's certainly ubiquitous and it seems yes. to seems it's to have a, a foothold everywhere. Uh, what do you say to people that ask you that question about like, well, OK, what, what am I supposed to do then? You know, I talk to a lot of the parents right now. I have a junior in high school. We're going to be applying. She just took her SATs, you know, this weekend. So we're definitely, and I have a soft, I mean, a freshman as well. And so we're definitely in the thick of it. Um, but I do talk to other parents. Um, I have found that a lot of the parents in Florida are very happy with the Florida schools. Well, they just um, they just fired all the TEI people at yes, the University of Florida, yes. for sure. I think um, some of the Christian schools are doing really well. I've heard Vanderbilt is doing really well. You know, what I look for, Jonathan, it's very simple. Has BDS passed in the student body of that school? And if it's the answer is yes, we're not going there. We're not applying. We're not doing any of that. And it's funny because my daughter, the 16 year old, she's like, mom, that's not brave. Like, I want to go to this campus and this Ivy League and I want to fight. And I'm like, great. So they should be paying me tuition because I'm paying tuition for you to go learn. I'm not paying tuition for you to go fight, you know, but she's like, no. And you know, that's her personality. 
Um, so we'll see where she ends up. But again, like, I, I want my kid to have freedom of speech and freedom of thought and not be afraid to say, like, you know, I like this candidate or I, I believe in this religion. And so, again, I want her to have the same kind of college experience that I had that I found, you know, I learned nothing new in college. I had taken so many APs at Harvard Westlake that literally I learned nothing new. I think I took a criminology class and I learned about Jeffrey Dahmer. That was like the only class that I remember that I was like, oh, something new, you know? Um, but what really was valuable about college was the independence, living by myself, you know, making sure I knew how to feed myself and wake up on time and, you know, all, and, and the conversations that you have. If the conversations are gone, what's the point of college? And I think we're seeing that, right? A lot of people are not going to college anymore or just going to community college to save money or doing trade schools instead. So if the college campuses do not fix this, it is going to lead to their downfall financially. Yeah. They yeah well, I, I think very that's the conceit. And that's certainly the conceit of, you know, the beginning of efforts to compete with them, such as, you know, the University of Austin, Barry Weiss and, now Ferguson, they're, they're counting, you know, they think that a, a campus where there will be free speech is, uh, you know, is, is the wave of the future. Um, you know, now, I just uh, saw a, a, um, an interview with a uh, Columbia student and, uh, you know, they're banging on her door at 1 a.m., terrorizing her, essentially. And, you know, the school's like, well, we can move you to another dorm. It's free speech. Now, can you imagine if that was a black student and the white students were doing that to a black student? It would never be tolerated. This hypocrisy, this double standard, all of this needs to be brought to light. You know, let the sun disinfect it. <laughs> like, bring it all to light. I'm a big believer in that. And I find that a lot of the, especially progressive Jews, uh, Ashkenazi Jews that have le led a pretty comfortable Jewish life in America um, are shell-shocked right now. They are yeah. absolutely and utterly shell-shocked. And so what I'm trying to do with my social media is to help them understand, like, the candidates you vote for are, are policy, vote for policy, or you don't have to marry the person, number one. I'm helping them see what has happened to the left. Like, we just saw Richie Torres speak on Saturday. The, and the congressman from the, the Bronx congressman in New York. from the Bronx. And, you know, he said, he said, for me to be a democratic Zionist, I'm getting so many threats. He said being a Zionist on the right is no big deal. He said that, right? And he said being a Zionist well, on true. the left yeah. is very difficult. But I'm, what I wanted to say is the very intelligent, successful, progressive Jews that were in the room, like they almost don't even hear that. I'm like, he just said it. He just said the anti-Zionist threat is coming from the left, but you still don't see it. It's like, I don't know. And they're very smart, Jonathan. Like, I don't understand. Maybe you could help me understand. You tell me. Well, I, I think, you know, um, there's a basic fact about American life, and that is that politics now plays the role that religion used to play in most people's lives. And politics, you know, you know, it, it's, it's like being a member of a tribe. I, you know, I often like to talk about intermarriage statistics um, you know, and the, the, the Gallup tracking polls, which in the 1950s had the overwhelming majority of Americans being adamantly against, you know, interracial marriage or interfaith marriage, but didn't care about marrying someone from a different political party. But now it's it's actually reversed. Most Americans at least say they're not against, inter, you know, say they're, you know, they have nothing against interracial marriage. And, you know, we, we certainly know that most Americans have nothing against interfaith marriage. But almost by the same numbers that they used to oppose interracial and interfaith marriages, they now oppose interparty marriage. You know, they they want if you're a Democrat, you won't marry a Republican, and and quite frankly, vice versa. We're a bifurcated society. So if when this infringes on your you know your identity as a Jew, if your if your identity as a Jew is not central to who you are. You know, if, if your faith, if your connection, your sense of Jewish peoplehood is not at the top of your priority list, you're just not going to, to, to pick up on these signals until almost it's too late. You yeah, know, let me tell you something really interesting. So it was like a few days after October 7th happened, maybe like a week max. And they asked me to go speak at a fundraiser for Bring Them Home Now, you know, the fundraiser. And so I got up and I gave on almost a very angry speech. Like, why didn't you listen to the Persian Jews? Why didn't you listen when we told you this is how Islamists think? They want you dead. 
Why didn't you listen to us? You know, it says it in their charter. Why won't you hear them? They're telling you it out loud. And then I got down and, you know, on stage, there's these families that literally had their mother killed, their sister killed, their brother killed, uh, hostages taken from their family. And I sat down and I was like, oh my gosh, maybe I was too harsh. But the first gentleman stood up and he said, I want to let you know that our religion wasn't Judaism. Our religion was peace and our religion has been shattered. So that's point number one. I think it was an awakening that no, your religion is Judaism, like bring it back, right? The other thing that was really interesting is Dan Center in his uh, new book, The Miracle of Israel. He says that um, he says that Israel has, you know, when you go bowling and they put the balloons on the, on the gutters, he says, because Israel f makes their kids go to the army, you might have the son of a tech billionaire in the same unit as the son of a bus driver, right? And so even though they might be politically completely you know, 180 degree opposite, they're still brothers. They still love each other. They still like do this. Now, he was saying that he went to a Harvard like mixer and he heard someone behind him talking he, and the person was like, oh my God, I just met a Republican. <laughs> As if like 70 million people in this country aren't Republicans, didn't right. vote Republican. And so it's become this sort of, uh, you know, echo chamber, not only online, but also in your life where you're not forced to interact with people who look different, that think differently, vote differently from you. And so it's really led to this uh, crisis. Really, it's a crisis um, of, of uh, you know, divisiveness, which I don't know how we fix that. Yeah, well, a lot of people think this battle against what anti-Semitism is a lost cause because of its grip on so many uh, institutions. I'm sensing that you're more optimistic than the doomsayers, but obviously, you know, the question then arises, how do you fight it? Now, the question I think that should be posed to you, you know, you have this huge following on social media, which you are, you know, you, you don't, you know, you are willing to use to advocate for Israel and the Jewish people. What does it take to be an effective influencer on any topic, but especially with respect to the war on, against Israel? I think in order to be the best kind of influencer, and I always say I'm the worst influencer because I'll publish something and they're like, you know, this news channel wants to interview tomorrow. And I'm like, I'm in surgery. I can't do it. So <laughs> it's like I'm the worst. But um, I think that what it takes is for you not to be speaking to the echo chamber. So five, six years ago, Jonathan, I hired a social media person and she's like, okay, what's the goal of our social media? Is it more money, more patience? What is it? And I said, no, it's to get as many people to follow us so we can fight anti-Semitism. This was five, six years ago. Okay. So it's always been my goal, whether I'm talking about beauty or plastic surgery or getting on Netflix or pitching another show, God willing, um, this week and next week, it's really about to pull people from all countries all religions, all languages, outside of our echo chamber, maybe they've never even met a Jew, but pulling them in because they're interested in something else and then slipping in the education about Israel and about Judaism and about acceptance and conservative values sometimes because everything's just gone nuts, I think, on the left. Um, and so really it's about the best influencer, I think, in the Jewish space and the Israel space is somebody who has pulled in people that didn't come for that. Because if someone doesn't believe it, they're never going to come follow you. But if you get people to come in for fashion or for beauty or for working out and fitness or something just completely unrelated, and then you slip it in and they already kind of love you and respect you. And they're like, okay, maybe I should listen to this person. I know they know what they're talking about. I know their intelligence. I know their character. I've been following them for a while then you have the power to change minds and then you have the power to educate. Whereas a lot of, you know, which I think also the just Jewish influencers that, you know, kind of um, have a very Jewish following, that's also good too, because we can um, unite voices, we can unite messaging. That's important too. But I think in order to change minds, you need to have them following you for reasons outside of Israel and Judaism. Yeah, that, that's, that's a very good point. In your opinion, as someone with some real expertise and experience in so using social media, you know, not just not just, you know, for Israel, but also in your, you know, in your career as a as a doctor and as an entrepreneur, 
How effective have pro-Israel efforts been since October 7th? Where do you think they've failed and where do you think they've succeeded? I think we fail in um, us trying to create our own hashtags. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or like we fail in like creating uh, five to 10 minute educational videos about the history of Israel. We're like, then the Romans and then the, you know, Arabian Peninsula and like all of this stuff, it doesn't work. So I usually just use the other side's hashtags. Like I'll do, you know, free hashtag free Palestine and then the word from and then hashtag Hamas. So I'm not doing the hashtag free Palestine from Hamas. No one's going to follow that other than Jews that already believe what you believe. But if you use that, if you separate it out and use the hashtags that are being seen by more people, that's like one strategy to get out of the echo chamber. Um, I think short and sweet videos, people forget that you have two seconds to capture someone before they keep scrolling. And so what I see is a lot of times like an organization will put their logo first for like two seconds before the video starts. It's like you lost them. What did you, why did you do that? Like you need to start, it needs to be the first two seconds. It needs to be the most inflammatory part of your, of what you're trying to get across. And then once you have them hooked, go into the long spiel. Um, so I think people forget sometimes they have so much to say that they forget what makes a successful Instagram post. The other thing, just to give you an idea, the algorithm will boost posts that people watch a larger percentage of the actual video. So let's say you watch three seconds of a one minute video, whether you watch three seconds of a 15 second video. So if somebody watches three seconds of a 15 second video, that's going to get boosted in the algorithm. But if somebody only watches three seconds of a one minute long video, it's going to be dead on arrival. So people really need to remember what they knew or, you know, maybe they need to learn the principles of, you know, playing the algorithm and what makes a successful social media post and apply it to whatever activism or point they want to make. Okay. Uh, note to uh, JNS staff. I hope you've been uh, <laughs> listening, taking notes. Um, how would you evaluate the efforts of our mainstream Jewish groups in this area? Are they up to date? When it comes to social media and the internet, or are they living in the past or even saying what must be said, do you think? I think the thing that I've been praying for that finally kind of happened is, um, sorry, I think the thing that I've been praying for that I think kind of recently happened is that people are starting to back people like myself who already have a massive social media following and are speaking to outside the echo chamber um, instead of trying to reinvent the wheel for their own organizations. So I'm seeing, you know, funding happening for influencers like myself who have been doing it all on my own with my own time, with my own money, and really saying like, thank you for what you're doing. Let us back you. Here is, you know, a lump of uh, support, um, whether it's financial support or whether it's like, let, let us write your scripts for you. Or do you need a ghostwriter to get that point across in an article? Or PR. Dr. Nazaria, we saw this article you wrote. Do you want us to help you with our PR mechanism to get it into this you know, Newsweek or get it into Wall Street Journal? Yes, please. You know, so I wish that the Jewish community, um, everyone's fighting for donors. Everyone's fighting to get their brand um, out there. You know, my friends and I were talking about creating the Jewish Media Summit, where we bring the leaders of JNS and Jewish Federation and Jewish Journal and, you know, all these people together into a room in Vegas. And then we say, this is our hashtag for the year. Everyone's going to use this hashtag or like, here's our diversity statement. Everyone's going to use detail. We're, we're not using DEI anymore, you know, and we get our messaging together. But I think it's really been lacking this unified voice. Because, you know, as they say, you get, you know, two Jews in a room, there's five opinions. Um, and there's so much ego involved rather than yeah. being like, guys, we're just trying to get a man on the moon. It doesn't matter who gets credit for it. Like I took detail. I sent it to everyone I know. And I said, modify it for your own use. Do what you will with it. It's yours. You know, this is for you. I don't need to be like, you know, detail by Dr. Sheila Nazarian. Like, I don't care. I'm just trying to save my kids and my grandkids. What should ordinary Jews, people without large followings or really any followings at all, be doing to help fight this battle? Yeah, I think that um, people don't understand social media. They think that if they only have 100 followers, they're not reaching anybody. 
you are reaching someone. It can get on the For You page. Somebody can catch it and repost it. Um, so keep posting on social media. That's number one. Number two, you can be the ones that are signing all of those petitions to the universities, to the Congress people. Call your Congress people. Vote. Um, you can be volunteering in Israel. You could be volunteering at your local Jewish organization. You could be doing fundraisers at your school to provide, I don't know, whatever it is that you know soldiers need or the families that are traumatized need. I know a bunch of therapists in America got together and after hours, because of, you know of the time zone, they will provide free therapy to the uh, you know Israelis that have been displaced or have uh, post-traumatic stress or you know are depressed. Uh, or, you know, are just dealing with the aftermath of all this trauma. Um, they, I knew another people that got together and, and bought laptops for all the kids that are, you know, in these hotels running around and not learning anything for the whole year. There's so much to do. There's so much to do. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I think you're, you provided a very inspiring example in your own life, as well as giving us some really good advice. Uh, Dr. Nazarian, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jonathan. It was my pleasure. We also want to thank our audience. Please remember to tune in every day for Top Story Daily Edition. And whether you're listening to us on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, or any of the other podcast platforms, or watching us live on Facebook or Twitter, or on the JNS YouTube channel, please like and or subscribe to Top Story. Click on the bell for notifications and give us good reviews. Please write to us at editor at JNS.org. Let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself, and we'll see you again next week.